I'd like to ask Mr. Uh, our Marine, uh, Mr. Dan Ibarra, to come and up. And if you guys can stand up and do the Pledge of Allegiance. You can come up, Mr. Danny. Don't be shy. <laughs> we want to also thank Danny for his service to this great country. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. you remember the Pledge of Allegiance or no? <laughs> Here we go. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. you guys can remain standing now, please. Uh, we have a famous, famous musician. His name is Jose Ramirez. Those of you that listen to this gentleman, pay attention to the talent, to the gift that he's gotten from above. He's someone that from the minute that we talked about this event, he wanted to be part of it. And we're, uh, this coming year, we're gonna take it to a whole different level. That's it, the floor is yours. Let's give a big round of applause. Internacional de Mexico. Uh, this guy has played for anybody that's anybody in the world of entertainment. I'd like to ask uh, the First Lady of Network of Champions to come up. Let's give her a big round of And one of the, power, the most powerful things that we have is gratitude. When you start acting in gratitude, you will see the universe start acting completely different towards you. And I uh, asked Adriana to come up, and uh, she also is one with a lot, with a very grateful heart. Uh, Adriana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yes, uh, we are very grateful all the time, constantly, right? But we first wanted to thank the cast, right? Without the cast, this will be impossible. It's a, it, it takes a lot of planning, believe it or not. So, uh, first of all, our photographer, Mike Olson, the Prince of Cali. <laughs> Together with Jan, Dan Works, the German guy that was here last month, he's coming back. But they put wonderful videos together. He is my personal uh, videographer for my listings. Okay, we have our sound engineer. He makes miracles happen. Uh, Benji, back here. Evan Planner, our new person, Barbara. Woo! Barbara Mills, awesome lady. Um, 
greeters, we have Barbara, we have Claudia Acevedo, we have Chris Wolsey, VP of Corporate Events, Vice President, without him, this organization and how these seats are together, Luis Jose Luis Hernandez. Co director, myself, producer and host, host Amado Hernandez. But let's talk about the sponsors. We are very lucky. We have uh, sponsors that are helping us make this a reality, and we have at the moment 12 of them. I'm going to go really fast. And that, again, we see the growth of the network of champions, and we're very, very grateful. We have ASI, All Solutions Insurance, John, and his team, Tequila Comisario. They're not here today, but you should try it. The Vega Construction, Javier, he is here. He is one of the greatest in Riverside County. He goes all over, but he's here. Um, ERC, uh, Natalie, she's not here, but if you need employer uh, retention, yeah, from the government, she's your girl, okay? Home Team Inspections, he's here, Juan Carlos. La Surtidora, La Surtidora, yes, Tobar Family. Advantage America, he's not feeling good, Eddie, today. But um, we have Michael Olson. We have Akela Pest Control. You know, I used to use Circle Customs for years. What happened is he went out of business. Well, I met up again with Yvonne in, uh, and Ivar, and now they're sponsoring us, Akela, and uh, you know, we welcome them today. The Disclosure Report NHD, Dan Sharp, is going to be a partner and sponsor today. Home First, Alexander Kim and his team. We have Rafael and Jesse and Claudia here, okay? Intelli-Loan, Mario Loria. Unfortunately, he woke up and not feeling very good. But we're very grateful. We see that network of champions accomplishing what he has set out to, to do which is educate, inform, giving information to all of us, and hopefully every one of you guys at the end is inspired, right? And we all understand not, uh, nothing of significance is ever accomplished alone. We're very clear about that. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, the sponsors and the cast. Thank you. Yeah. I am going to ask the panelists uh, to come up. Uh, today we have a treat for you guys, and Mr. Fuentes, if you can come up here to the front. Pat, where are you at? I don't see you. If you can come up, okay. And then Robert Brellas. You want a big, big round of applause? You know, I've been an REO agent from the beginning of my career, over 35 years. And the way to be an REO agent is to know people like them. I never go to none of those things to buy books, uh, CDs, or none of that, because they're just selling something. The true people behind the scenes, and that's why I wanted to bring them. I want to give a special thanks to someone that <coughs> Throughout my career, he's been a great, great friend, great endorser, always there when I've done different projects. And I'd like to ask for a very special applause to my very good friend, Mr. Frank Fuentes. <laughs> I'm gonna start with uh, Frank, and as you can start with the first question, and I'll let you uh, give, it the mic, give it the mic. First of all, thank you, Amados, for those very kind words. It's my pleasure to be here at the Network of Champions now and give back, give back to the community of real estate practitioners and, and just collaborate, right? Um, especially now with market conditions the way they are. I think right now is one of the most important times for us to come together, whether you're a lender, realtor, whatever, um, a 
affiliate you are, these are really important times. So just happy to be here. And with that, uh, we'll get started with the first question. And so the first question is very basic. Who is Trustee Corpse and what services do you provide? So I'll do a quick intro. Do I think I need the mic? I don't need it either. I've got kids. I don't so I'll do a quick intro, but before I do that, just a show of hands. How many realtors are kind of new within, let's say, five years to real estate? Okay. Who's done it for more than 10? 15? 20? All right, we'll stop there so nobody else starts. Right, so follow-up question, how many are familiar with REOs? Yes. Okay, all right. So my name is, my stage name is Rob Ruelos, usually, because, <laughs> you know, people can't roll their R's, but I think with this, this audience, I can say Roberto Ruelos. Hey. I've, uh, so Trusty Corps got founded in 1992. I've been there since 1999. Then things got a little more difficult, so we needed somebody smarter, and you started in... 2011. 2011. <laughs> so Trusty Corps, we do the foreclosure process, which is basically notice of default, very beginning, to trustees deed upon sale, right? So the foreclosure sale. Um, we have a couple of other arms that are part of our business. There's a law firm that does evictions. Maybe you've dealt with Malcolm and Cicero's, if you're on the REO space. And then there's Harmony Escrow that does closings. Not just an REO, but traditional escrows. Maybe you're familiar with them. But Trusty Corps is strictly foreclosure. We work with different servicers. Um, maybe something you've worked with. Certainly something you've heard of. Including and again, the American funding. It, including the American funding. Um, and again, it's just the, the default servicing process. Would you like to add to that, Kathy? Well, there's, you know, it's a, foreclosures is a whole different arena. So some of you that have done REOs, uh, and we'll go into it a little bit more. Some of you that have done REOs, you understand it's a whole, it's very sensitive, it's a timing issue, it's all kinds of things. So the whole idea is, I know we all have a short time, so all of you that want to talk after, I'm more than happy to as Rob as well, <coughs> some part, right? Um, to talk about some nuances for you and how the market has changed a lot. So we're gonna go into that a lot, because a lot of things have changed, a lot of law changes. I'm very involved in the California legislation of what changes. I, I'm president of the United Trustees Association, which is all the trustees that do foreclosures. So I'm president of that association, so I'm very involved in the California laws and interested in some of the things that you have, because we try to take a lot of that back too when we incorporate new laws. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, I have a question, or maybe whoever can answer it. What is the current state of distressed sales? Uh, the media says one thing, but behind the scenes is completely different. And, uh, you know, the fact that you guys trace the performance of the nodes, different market segments of markets and stuff. Uh, what is the uh, current state of the sales? Yeah, so, so a couple of things, right? Obviously, we know during the pandemic that kind of came to a halt for us, right? Um, we heard uh, about the moratoriums, I'm sure. When those ended, I think a lot of people, maybe the media, uh, expected some kind of a foreclosure avalanche that obviously has not come. Um, I would say just now, so for me, I'm on the, on the client relations sales side of the house, meaning I'm the one that's dealing with the servicers, right? So for me, I look at when the referral comes in, notice default file, because that's what I track, that's how I work. She gets the bigger picture, she looks at the whole process, but. For us, we're just now starting to hit pre-pandemic numbers. So it's it's not an avalanche, and it hasn't been. And again, it's just starting to kind of normalize as far as the default market. Now, as far as when it gets to, to the sale part of it, that would be more you. So it's different. So pre-pandemic, when the pandemic hit, everything halted, nothing. What I'm seeing now is we do foreclosures in six states. What I'm seeing now is a lot of these COVID modifications. What every, states are those doing, sure? So Arizona, California, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, and Texas. We do Alaska as well, so seven. So, um, But what's happening now is all those COVID modifications are all now coming due. So the problem is, is can you, are you at the same income you were at before, right? And if you're not, 
Is it reverting back to whatever your payments were then? That's an issue that's going to start. The other thing is HELOCs. Everybody got a HELOC because interest was low, but everybody's tapping their HELOCs. So what happens with mortgagers normally, they'll pay their first, but they won't pay their HELOC. So anticipate HELOCs now starting to come due and people, people have equity in their house. And, and I sit here and I look at this every day. We have sales every single day. Why didn't you sell your house? You have tons of equity in your house. Shame on you guys. And <laughs> I'm telling you, tons of opportunity out there. There's tons of equity and yet they go to foreclosure sale. And people buy them at the foreclosure sale. Now I'm dealing with two, three hundred dollars, three hundred thousand dollars of surplus money because somebody put their head in the sand and didn't sell their house. So tons of opportunities for you guys out there. Every single day, I see properties go to sell with tons of equity in it. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Um, a shout out to my friend Hugo back there. I'm sure he's dealing with an emergency back there on his phone. But uh, yeah, I mean, this, this, this is this is a recurring topic that, that we've discussed in a lot of mastermind sessions we've had with him. And yeah, I agree. There's tons of opportunity, and hopefully, again, the whole intention here is to bring you something unique, relevant that you can use today. So, one question I had as you were talking, Kathy, is do you, as far as distress sales, do you see more distress sales in some areas than others? Talking about California, the desert areas versus LA Metro, any certain patterns you've seen or is it too soon to tell? I think it's too soon to tell. I think it's kind of across the board. I think it's across the board. Um, it, it's unfortunate when I look at these every day. I mean, and there's and lots have changed a lot about buying foreclosures too. So it's a whole different market. But I gotta tell you, there is so much fraud out there. And, and that's one of my biggest issues with California legislation. There is so much fraud, and the borrowers don't know who to trust. And when I get the call, it's like, I don't know who to believe anymore, right? So trust is so important with all of you guys and finding somebody they can absolutely trust that has the best interest for them. And a lot of times I have to walk, you know, talk them off the, the ceiling because you know, they're looking for someone just to listen to them. But let tons and tons of opportunities for you guys. Um, because when I see this surplus money and I think, what could they have sold their house for? Because now you're buying a distressed sell. So if you're going to foreclosure sell, you don't want to pay the top dollar for it, right? Depending on what it is. So they could have sold it for so much more. And it's, it's sad. I see it every single day. Now, one, one quick question, um, and maybe both of you can elaborate. What caught my attention is the, the fraud. Can you give us just a couple of examples of some schemes that are currently uh, being used out there? No, well, before we get to that, so I don't have a geographical answer for you, but if you remember the last mortgage crisis, we knew subprime, right? We knew all the loans that we were foreclosing on. I think the answer that I can give you, and maybe you can back into it, looking at some reporting is, now, it seems like reverse mortgages were the big jump because their, their moratoriums ended before everybody else's. So that was a big push. And then HUD, all those HUD loans seem to be what, I think as an industry, we recognize as the new subprime. So, yeah, so if you have any reporting or if there's any reporting out there that tells you maybe geographically where those type of products are, then maybe you can back into that answer. Got it. Okay. FHA loans. Yeah, we do a lot of reverse mortgage. Reverse mortgages was the only exception um, during COVID that didn't have to, that didn't apply. So as COVID hit, we still foreclosed on reverse mortgages. Oh, wow. And those are all different. You know, normally the reason for default in that is either the borrower dies, the borrower moves out of the home, which is no longer their primary residence where they become delinquent on taxes and insurance. So reverse mortgages continue throughout the process. So I'm in talking to some of you, you all know that a lot of your inventory is when people have died or somebody's trying to sell it, right? Because there's like, you're seeing no inventory out there, but there are opportunities. So some of the scammers are like, people will go to the borrower and say, sell it to me, sign this deed, and I'll let you rent it back for me and you can stay here and live right. here, right? And they believe that, but that doesn't happen. Uh, a lot of the scams are at the foreclosure sale, when the foreclosure sale happens now, it's different now. So you can bid on a property, but there's different ways to bid on a property. So if you have, I'm gonna tell you this, if you have an all cash buyer, 
who is looking for their primary residence. Perfect opportunity to buy right now. Because you can buy at a foreclosure sale and you tender a declaration, which means you're buying as your personal residence and you're, then you don't have to compete against anybody. Because right now it's a competition thing. So if you buy a foreclosure, we have to wait 15 days to see if other bids come in. And at the end of 15 days of other bids come in, then it extends it to 45 days, similar to what the HUD program is now on the REO first side. Look. Yeah, the first look program, similar to that. There's different categories that you qualify to bid under. But as a prospective owner occupant, great opportunity for an all cash buyer, if you have that. Uh, if you're bidding, uh, like the normal people, the, the, the investors will bid. The other way you can bid is if you're a nonprofit. That's where the fraud's coming in. People are bidding as a nonprofit, and the, the law changed this year. It's changed every year. It's going to change again next year. So the law changed that if you buy as a nonprofit, you have to hold this property for 30 years before you can sell it. So do you think they're doing that? Every day I get a call from an investor that says, I'm tracking this. And the minute it turns, I'm reporting them. So now the law is that any time a trustee's deed records, we have to upload it to the Attorney General for the state of California because they're trying to prevent the fraud. I don't think you're going to see that maybe for a couple more years, but somebody is going to be the scapegoat. Somebody is going to be the one that they're going to set the example for. And that's frustrating for us because I have all these requirements that they have to fulfill. And if they fulfill those, that's all I can do, whether I think it's fraudulent or not. That's yeah. not for me to make that decision, right? But it's frustrating. It's very frustrating. So I see it every day, every day. I have a quick question. Sorry, Mom. Um, as far as the, the primary residence purchase, what are the requirements, documentation that have to be provided for someone to be cleared as a primary home? Easy. It's really easy. Primary residence, you say, buying this, the only contingency is you must occupy the property for one year. That's it. Has to be your primary residence for one year. At the end of the year, if you want to sell, you sell, but you have to live in it. The other piece to this, you can only buy obviously, one property for one year, right? So you should be off that list because nice. if you bought one, you can't continue to buy. Got it. So what happens amongst those trustees, there isn't a list that the attorney general, that's what we're trying to do is because we have to report these, but for the attorney general to provide that list for all of us to see. So what happens between most of the big trustees like ourselves, we compare. So we'll say, hey, has this person bought anything from you yeah. within the year because then they don't qualify? So you have to wait a year. So you can't be out there buying all these properties because then you're committing fraud. Again, you have to occupy for one year. Excellent. Back to yeah. I, this question is for Frank. Frank, uh, New American Funding, you guys have, you have Tiffany, by the way, uh, have that all cash program. Would something like that work on, a, on this type of property or this type of purchase? Actually, great question, great thought, but it actually would not. Just trying to be creative, guys. <laughs> Okay. I like the uh, way you think. Yeah. My question uh, to Kathy is, what must a realtor know about the foreclosure process in 2023 and how, we're business, as business people, how can we capitalize on this distress sales? So there's a lot of different entities that provide uh, documentation for recordings for like notice of defaults. That's where you track it. Understand if you're in the REO world, you're running up against a timeline, right? So the notice of default records, and then we wait 90 days, and then we set it for sale, which is normally another 30 to 45 days. So you've got to tell yourself that when that night, that clock starts ticking, that's your timeline to get it through to try to close this deal. If you're up against a sale date, let's say the sale date's next week, and you have a, you have a buyer, what you need to do is be prepared. When you send it to the trustee, because that's who you're talking to, or if you're trying to talk to the, the servicer, you. yeah, which would be us, if you're, if you're coming to us because you have the notice of default, you want to make sure, number one, you have the authorization from the homeowner that we can talk to you, number one, right? Because otherwise, we're not talking to you. But two, well, it's, you know, we have to make sure. The other thing is you have to have a signed offer. You need to have proof of funds. So don't waste everybody's time, right? Have the whole complete package. Then what we will do is send it to the servicer and say, we'll ask you, how much time do you need to close? You have an open escrow, how much time do you need? If you continue to send offers in and they keep falling out, chances are the servicer at some point is gonna say, no, we're going to sell, buy it at the sell, right? 
So make sure when you send that initial package, it's a complete package. Or call the trustee and say, what do I need to send you to send it to the servicer? Just make sure you have everything documented, everything there, and then we'll track it. And you can track it through the servicer as well. But we will take it and we'll forward it to them. And we'll also tell them, hey, sale date set, we need to push. Are we going to get a postponement or not? If you have everything and you show proof of funds that the servicer is going to get paid 100%, why wouldn't they give you that time to close? They don't want the properties back, guys. Contrary to what everybody thinks, they don't want inventory on REOs. They don't want that. They'd rather have the loan fully paid off. So one thing that, that came to mind, the other day I was browsing on foreclosures myself in LA County. I forgot what website it was. I think it was provided by a, by a title company. And I noticed there was like 180 plus at, at sale, but the majority were postponed. Yeah. Um, so there was really nothing going to the auction block. So my question is, how many times can it be postponed and what's the process like thereafter? So for California, it's one year from the original sale date. That's the law. Okay. So one year, 365 days from the original sale date. Arizona, it's unlimited. Other states have different requirements, right? They're all statutory, but California is from one year before. Normally, when a sale is postponed, it will tell you why it was postponed. So it could be loss mitigation, they're trying to do a workout, bankruptcy. could be bankruptcy, which is very, very common. So what happens if it comes to the one year anniversary, then we have to take it off the calendar. And then once it's released, we set it for sale again. That's how it works. Kathy, uh, what has changed? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. What did I have to say? No, 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 because I was thinking about oh, I don't know. <laughs> Hey, I was I was shown when you go for something, just grab it, okay? That's right, that's right. Uh, what has changed since 208 in the foreclosure and distressed asset proceedings? You're like right there on the cutting edge of all these different changes. Uh, what has changed? No, that's you. That's me. I'm trying to help. That's definitely you. Number one, equity. Next one's for you. Best you get the next one. Equity's changed, right? Equity in the house. 2008, we were underwater huge, right? People were giving properties away. Please buy it. Now we have equity, tons of equity, tons of opportunities. Back then, you had tons of things on the market that you could buy for really cheap, and we didn't. Some people didn't do that. Some people wish they could have and would have. Um, but you got to remember, in California, when you buy property at foreclosure, it's all cash, all cash, no letter of credit, no down payment. Right now. It's a little bit different if you're if you're coming under the the 15 day rule that we talked about. So it's a little bit different how you qualify then. But let's say you bid at a property, you put a notice of intent in, you have 45 days to get the funds in. So you got a little bit of time if you're buying if you're buying as a prospective owner occupant, you guys wouldn't qualify as a nine profit. But if you have someone there, it's a 45 day. But you got to be able to have the all cash. So again, people are either getting hard money loans because it's hard to get a loan because there's no guarantee you are going to be the successful bidder. So trying to get somebody to give you a loan with no guarantee you can't do that, right? So some properties I have, maybe it's only one notice of it, some I have like 15. And some may bid and some may not. So it all depends, all depends. Okay, great. <laughs> this question's for Robert. Um, so as far as creating relationships. I know you're a big relationship guy. So for everybody in the audience here, when it comes to distressed assets and lenders and servicers, give us some, some golden nuggets, some value add of what these realtors should be doing to, to prepare themselves and just open up that channel, that possible channel of business. So a couple things, right? So, so far what Kathy's been talking about is really sales during the foreclosure process, right? Where you're dealing with the borrower, the homeowner, and we're just really intermediaries between you guys and the servicers. And I think, sort of just throw this out there real quick, I think sometimes there's a misconception, Frank, because we're a, tr a trustee shop, right? And because of our title, when we go to some of these conferences or the name of the company, some folks might think that we maybe control some of these assets at REO, which is not the case, right? But I will say this. So, like I go to all, all the conferences, every single one. I think I'm at one every month, if not more. Um, 
can you mention the name? Of the so a couple of them. So Five Star is a big one. Five, five Star is a big one. Star. That was a very big REO conference a few years ago, and then as those kind of went away, it's a, it's kind of morphed into more of a default servicing conference in general. Uh, but still, a lot of asset management companies go there. A lot of services are there. So so that's one of them. Certainly, there's uh, the old Rio Man, which I think is now NADP. Um, I think NARREP has one, ARIA has one, where some of these asset managers go. But uh, to answer your question about the relationships, so I think one of the things that I see, outside looking in a little bit, is I think in your side of the world, it's very much a sales, close, close, close. Every day we're closing, all about closing, right? right. Where I feel like in this side of the world, where you're trying to deal with some of these asset management companies, some of these servicers, it's more of a long point. You're not really going for the touchdown pass. You're trying to get to the to the first goal, right? So I think that's where I see the biggest issue because a lot of the people that I deal with on the vendor management side, on the servicer side, they feel like the broker community is very aggressive, right? Because again, it's it's always be closing. So I think the, the piece of advice that I would say is maybe if you want to go after that market, go to some of these conferences, go for the first goal, build a relationship. You're not trying to close that particular day, but maybe, hey, where are you at? You're from Dallas? Okay, well maybe next time I'm in town, uh, two, three months from now, can I come by and maybe do a lunch or do a dinner or whatever it is, and really foster the relationship and know that it's, it's a long haul. It may be a year. I think for me on my side of the business, it's about a year closing cycle before I build a relationship, go through venture management, go through legal, go through operations, to, to we see file one, right? So I think that would be my my advice. Slow play it, build the relationship, the business will come. We'd like to open up uh, for questions. Uh, Any questions? Yeah. Hi, how are you? Maria Alvarez. Uh, Robert, I just saw you a uh, five star, yeah. you know, and I, but I have two, it was two questions. You know, I was, I've been in the industry since 2000, uh, Six, so I was part of the or previous, you know, I did a lot of short sale back in the day. I recently closed one where the second was going to foreclose, yeah. right? And when I ordered my day off, the second, yeah, there's still seconds. A lot of them are out there. I, there's a lot of 80-20s, believe it or not. Now I know the system really well. So I closed this one. So my thing is when I ordered the payoff on the second, which was the one that was foreclosing, the original one was for 68 grand. When I got my payoff, it came back at 163000 I was like, this is a typo. Like, yeah, I even called Esther and I was like, ah, what? I couldn't believe it, but it was. So obviously, the banks are taking advantage. Of, I wouldn't say the banks taking advantage, but like, I wouldn't know how to word this. But the fact that the properties have equity, I believe that you know that's one of the reasons why it's coming back at that. Awesome. Now, my second question to you is because I'm, this is the approach I'm taking with my clients right now. Don't lose your equity to foreclosure, right? But my thing is, being a, a non, you know. Um, State, you know, I'm sorry, that word. Um, how long does do you see people like, let's say, go through foreclosure, right? And they still have like three hundred thousand dollars in equity. How long would you proceed for them to receive their, uh, you know, the, because they're gonna get their money one way or the other, whether it's a year or from now or not, minus all the fees, REO, da da da, you know, foreclosure. How long do you see them getting recouping their money or part of it or partial? So you're talking about surplus funds? Yeah, I'm talking about the owners. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so here's how it works with surplus. Yeah. Normally, if depends on what the links are. So understand when you foreclose, you foreclose on deeds of trust. So first deed of trust, second deed of trust, third deed of trust. Common misconception from people is when I buy a foreclosure, I see this notice that's up. Oh my God, this house is only $40,000. No, it's the deed of trust. So you need to do your homework to see where that deed of trust is that's being foreclosed. It could be a fifth deed of trust, right? You're subject to the senior liens, always. The second thing you were talking about, I wonder what kind of loan that was, who the servicers and what type of loan that was. Again, people get into these loans that I look at that are unbelievable. I see them every day. I see the terms and everything. Some have, you know, all different defaulted, hard money. It, there's all kinds of loans that people get into. Understand there is a huge compliance that servicers all must meet because they all fall under CFPB. Right. That they have to itemize every single, you know, every single fee, cost, everything that they're charging. That payoff should have listed everything. Yeah. I'll tell you why. The same thing applies at surplus. I go to foreclosure sale today, 
30 days from today, notices have to go out to the borrowers saying you have surplus money here, you need to tender your claim. What comes out of that would be possibly a title endorsement to ensure what lien positions, when you have surplus money, liens get paid first that are on the property. The difference of that is then considered equity money. That goes to the homeowner. So you gotta pay all the liens first. So that gets paid first, whatever's left over goes to the homeowner. A homeowner needs to submit a claim in. They submit a claim, then it gets, should get, it gets paid immediately. There's no reason why it couldn't be, but it's getting everybody to submit the claim. So let's say we foreclosed on the second, I need to get the claim in from the first for their payoff. If they have you know, rubbish liens or water liens or whatever it is, I've gotta get the payoff demands for all those. Once I get those and I pay all those off, then I can pay the homeowner. So and that's how it works. are being submitted to you. To, to actually court. not to trustee courts, to our law firm that does it. To the law firm. So it's submitted to the law firm. But 30 days goes out, notices to everybody that potentially could have a claim that they have to get it back to us. Now, if somebody comes in, let's say there's family fighting over who owns the money and all this stuff, right? Because, you know, that never happens. <laughs> then the firm will make the decision to what we call it, it cheated to the state. They file and, and they send it to the state and then the state can make the determination as to who gets the money because you don't want to play that at that point. Yeah, to, to answer your question, it was a HELOC. And I was yeah. still able to pay, like they had like EDD lien, they had a uh, child support lien, so I paid everything, we paid right. everything, and I was still gave them back like 80 grand. Obviously, they were expecting more, since right. their thing was like, oh, I only owe 68. Right. But I was still yeah. able to get them some money so they can actually, at least the, the plan was to buy, but now they're less cash, you know? So we, I ended up finding them a rental, and I'm going to into a rental. Right. It's a future buyer, but I right. mean, I'm just saying, it's, just, it's just incredible what these homeowners don't understand what they can lose. Right. About, they lost oh, over $100,000. You'd be surprised. There's so many homeowners that put their head in the sand. Yeah. They don't open their mail anymore because they're delinquent. They don't tell anybody. They don't know what to do. And it's like you're sitting on all this equity money. Sell your house. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want to sell their house. My kids for go you guys to school. To come well, I, you know, my kids go to school here. I, I've lived here for 15 years. It was a family. They don't want to give it up. But at the end of the day, they don't understand this is potentially how much money you're going to lose that you could have had. So you're going to lose. So when you go to sale, it's fair market value or total debt. And right now it's total debt because fair market value is up there, right? right? So let's say, this isn't true, but let's say it's $600,000. But if you could have sold it for $800,000, guess what? It's going to go to foreclosure sale and guess what it's going to go for? Probably a little bit more than that and they lost all that equity money that they could have. And then they're only gonna recover whatever that amount is. You know, I, and, I, and it's unfortunate because a lot of homeowners are on the fence because they don't believe whatever. Right. Right? So I, I'm a door knocker. So when I go visit this one, obviously I target. And I take I take everything that's on title against it because I'm not gonna take a retrump thing and they're gonna believe on what I'm saying. So I take everything that's recorded against the property with me because that's my window of opportunity for mm -hmm. me to speak with them. It's like, hi, I'm here, let me, you know, you're losing your home. You have to prove them. You know, and that's what I told like my agents. I'm like, whenever you're out there, you need to take all of this because there's no just, oh, okay, well, I'm here and you're losing your home. I'm pretty sure they're getting a lot of those calls. Well, they get a lot of calls. paraphrase because none of us can hear this one on one conversation. So I'm not sure even what she's oh. asking. She's please. talking about when she's going and she's doing door, no door knockers to people that are delinquent. So she's taking a complete title report with her to be able to show. You're right, because when a notice of default is filed, it becomes a public record, right. which means that homeowner gets all kinds of advertising for delinquent loan. I can help you get, I can give you a loan, I can save it, I can. So going to that homeowner to prove that you're truthfully going to help them is huge, and getting them to believe that they can trust you. And maybe one of the other things is, you have them call their trustee to say, hey, you know, and, and sometimes it depends on who the trustee is. Obviously, I can't speak for everyone, but if someone's calling our office, we try to help that homeowner. My job is the middle person, to help the homeowner, and not to necessarily foreclose, but to help you retain your house, or more importantly, keep your equity in your house, right? So if somebody's calling <laughs> me and I'm getting that call, I'm gonna be honest with them and say, look, if I pull up Zillow or something, your house is valued at this, you could get this, if you go to foreclosure sale, this is what you're gonna get. So you need to have that conversation. But again, the whole bottom line here is developing the trust with the homeowner. 
Real quick, so, and one more thing along those lines and, and talking about burying their head in the sand. So, we send out the NOD, we record it, and to your point, they've had a lot of people knock on their doors, they've gotten a lot of mailers, they've gotten a lot of phone calls, and they do bury their head in the sand, unfortunately, that to the point where they stop opening mail. So it could very well be that now we're at a notice of sale, and there's a sale date, but they don't know it because they've not opened that envelope. Right, so I think what you're doing is, is pretty huge because now you've got documentation with you that says, "No, look, there is a sale date potentially. Here's what it is, and there's a sense of urgency." One more question, Ivan. Hi, I have two questions. Um, first of all, I've been working NOD since last October. Um, the referrals through a government agency, so I have that trust already. So, one of the things I noticed when I called the servicer. The minute we request a modification, we're given 60 days. Is that something that's a law, or they give a 60-day extension? Yeah, so it's, it depends on what kind of loan it is or whatever, but there's a CFPB regulations that they have to follow. Okay. And if you provide enough documentation, they have to allow a certain time for you to complete that. And you have to, com you know, you have to comply and give all the documentation that they're requesting. If you fail to comply, they'll send you a notice saying you didn't comply. So now we're going to move forward with the foreclosure. And NOD is a notice of default for some of you. So notice of default, 90 days, then a notice of sale, which is actually posted on the door and mailed and posted in a public place. And all these are public record. Everything's public record, so everybody sees it. One of the things that I probably need to tell you that's coming down that, that's going to affect all of you, there's a new bill. It's not new, actually. It's on the governor's desk right now. It's, a, it's a Senate Bill 696, remote notaries, which is key to all you guys, right? California is one of four states that does not have a bill for remote notaries. I'm pretty sure it's going to pass an opt-in. It's going to pass by October 14th. However, it's probably going to take a year to two for the state to put it in place because we always do these great bills we sign, and we never have a program for it. So the Secretary of State has to build a program and everything for it, but it looks like it's been a, it's been a sign and there will be remote notaries that will go into effect. So I know that affects your world huge. So What's, what what's the impact of that? Well, it's, it's the tracking of it is what the biggest issue is for the state. That's why it's taking so long. Everybody wants the ability to have a remote notary. And what the criteria is going to be for verification on all that, I don't know yet because I've not actually read what's going on so but I know that it's at the governor's it's passed everything else it's at the governor's to sign and it's uh, looks like it's going to sign it doesn't affect me on my end of the world but I know it affects you for your closings and stuff like that so just as an FYI for you guys They've been involving, the last four have been involved uh, zombie loans, which are those loans that have been dormant. And then anywhere from seven to one I'm working on right now is 14 years. That second that had been resold from the, from the first loan, the originator, is now coming back 14 years later and saying, guess what, you owe this. It and should be kind of a... And each, um, each referral that I've received has a different situation, they're different right. stories, right. but I'm hearing the same yeah, so what she's talking about are these what we call zombie loans. So what happened back in the day, 2008, there were second deeds of trust HELOCs and whatever, and, and the banks didn't charge them off. They just put them aside, and then they, what they did is they sold them for pennies on the dollar to someone else, and now they're trying to revive those, right? Coming back, investors coming back and saying, you owe me from 2008 now. Exactly, and now you've got to pay all this up, all this back interest and everything else. The issue becomes statute of limitations. There is a statute of limitations in California, and it all depends on the date. So if it's coming to my world, the first thing that we look at is ensuring that the statute of limitations hasn't passed because you can't foreclose if statute of limitations has. So we look at all that. But you're going to see that you're going to see a lot of that. Um, I can tell you, I have a huge USDA portfolio that we have, and you want to see a hot mess? I can show you a hot mess. <laughs> I have loans from like 1988. So yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Now, in most of them across the, the nation, you cannot submit a loan to foreclosure until it's 120 days delinquent. So clearly the homeowner knows they haven't been paying, right? Because by the time it gets to me, it's probably six months delinquent. 
So just as an FYI. Yeah. Okay, I think we're done. I think we're done. <laughs> Questions, uh, we'll be here. So if you guys need something after, you feel free to come talk to us. I'd like to ask you guys to give a big round of applause. <laughs> Next, we have a treat for you guys. This is my son, Robert, and whom I am well pleased. Uh, Robert has been a great, great friend of Mr. Uh, Mikey Garcia, and I'm gonna ask him in 30 seconds uh, to say a few things about Mikey. What makes the great, great Robert? My dad just surprised me out of the blue. <laughs> Talk. But now Mikey's a good uh, personal friend of mine, uh, one of the most humble, giving uh, guys that I've uh, ever known. Uh, just donates his time, donates to charity, uh, goes to all kinds of events. Uh, just a real good uh, dad, father, uh, just a good all-around person. You know, he, you, I could count on him if he says he's going to be somewhere or do something. He comes through all the time, so uh, just a good good guy. Um, I have nothing but good things to say about him. Uh, one of my best friends. So. I'd like to have Mr. Michael Garcia, he can come up and I'm going to give him the microphone so he can tell us who is Mikey Garcia, what makes Mikey Garcia tick. He has something for each one of us that when we walk out of here we should be empowered, we should be inspired because our goal is to give you guys the tools so that you guys can walk into that space that you guys have been designed to. If you guys could please stand up and give Mikey a big, big round of applause, please. Hello, everybody. Oh, well, for some actually follow boxing, they know who I am, but for those that don't, it's okay. I'm here to let you know. <laughs> Okay, so, former boxing world champion uh, across four different weight classes. I retired uh, next month, two years ago, next month. Um, had a career of about 16 years as a professional boxer. Um, I competed in 126 pounds, 130, 135, 140, and my last three fights were at 147. Um, finished my career with a record of 40 wins, two defeats. You know, like I said, 16 year career, so it's, it, was a, it was a long career. Um, but early on, I wanted to prepare myself for after boxing. I knew boxing would only take me so far and allow me to have, uh, you know, a, a life that, that I can, you know, continue after boxing. So I actually, you know, decided and then saw the opportunities with real estate, which I'm sure everybody here is, is very, very knowledgeable and more than I am. But um, I saw opportunities in real estate and I started making relationships. We were talking, Rob was talking about relationships and we've talked about, you know, having having the, the right team and the people around you. And that's kind of what I started to form in back in 2010, 2012, when I started first getting a little bit of money from boxing. I did meet Rob Robert um, back then. I think it was like 2011 when I met him, and he introduced me to other people and so on and so forth. Just like we are right now, meeting everybody and introducing each other, and you know, exchanging the business cards and whatnot. That's where it starts. I mean, this is how you develop relationships. This is how you start, and those relationships will, you know, bring something in, in the future. Whether it's it's you know maybe an opportunity to do some business or even just a, a lot lifelong friend, you know, but um, this is where it, where it all begins. And I, I did this, I showed up to a lot of events, showed up to a lot of conferences, just meeting the right people and getting to know everybody's, you know, background. And I was able to put a lot of that together and started investing in boxing, through boxing, investing into real estate, whenever the opportunity was, was available. Um, I've been, you know, fortunate to have made a lot of money through boxing that I was able to invest and still right now still continue to do it. Um, the last few years were, were very, very good in 
in real estate for, for flips, for, for rental opportunity, buying opportunities. Right now it's kind of a different time, slow down, but the opportunities are still there. Just like we, we're, we're hearing, you know, you just gotta find the right ones, the right opportunities. Um, if you're here for the long run, I mean, you're always gonna do great. You know, some of you have heard, you know, 10 years in the business, 15 years, 20 years in the business. I mean, you obviously know a lot more than I do, but I can tell, I mean, if, if that's, those are facts, you know, and that's proven that in the long term, you know, there's so many opportunities in real estate and it's, it's a huge industry. You know, you don't have to be the one investor. You don't have to be the one agent. There's so many different areas that you can be involved in helping people. And it's not just about personal gain. You know, you help somebody, whether it's a sale of a house or a purchase of their home. You know, they're making their dream come true by purchasing their home. If you can help them give them the tools, information, so that they can have the best opportunity to purchase that for their families, that's, that's amazing. That's, that's, you know, wonderful. You know, and I've done some of the stuff, some of that through the flips where you, you know, take this home and repair it and fix it up. And, you know, the, the smile on their face when they buy the home and they see it when you showcase them, it's just, it's just great, you know? So, yes, you make business too. Yes, you make money. And everybody's happy in the end. Everybody gets their, their, their way. Everybody's making, you know, their, their uh, money if you're involved in the business side. But if not, if you're purchasing, like, like I said, a home, they're gonna be happy because now they got something for their families that they can look forward to for, for many years to come. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very happy with, with real estate because like I said, it employs a lot of people from my people that do the rehab, people in the office, people who do the, the sale, the paperwork, everything. Everybody is, 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 is involved and it takes a team. It really does take a team. You gotta form the right team to have the, the right people helping with the same goal. Um, I've kept, you know, my, my friends that are in, in my team, you know, for many years. Like I said, I've known Robert for, you know, 10, 12 years, James over there in the back, um, you know, just everybody, because we all have the same goal. And I mean, if we go back to boxing, I learned, you know, dedication, discipline, you know, the hard work, all that through boxing, but you transfer all that in, in business, you transfer all that, you use all that. Everything that I used in, in, in boxing, you know, getting up in the morning every day, you know, training, diet, you know, hard work for day day in day out, week after week, that's the same you know same structure you need in, in real estate, same thing you need in any business. You got to be dedicated. You got to be disciplined. You got to have your your eyes on the prize. You know where your goal is. You know where you want to be. Well, you got to take the steps to get there. Nothing happens overnight. None. I can't just get up in the morning and say, oh, I want to fight, you know, next next day and, and be successful. It doesn't happen. It takes many, many days of training, years of, 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 of boxing to get to, you know, the, the end result. Well, in business, it's the same thing. You know, you got you to gotta be committed. You got to be dedicated to the craft, to the business. And if you apply that, you know, and be consistent, then you will show the, the results will, will, will be there. But you can, you know, take days off, like, you know, just, oh, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it today. I mean, you always gotta be on it. Once in a while you do take breaks, you do need some uh, break, mental break, whatever, that's fine, that's understandable. Just like we do, I'm, you know, after boxing, after my fight, I take a couple weeks off, that's fine. But then you get back at it. You don't, you don't let that uh, keep you away from your, from your goal and continuing on that path. So when I come out here, with, with some of my friends, you know, in, in real estate, and I'm always learning. There's always opportunity to learn. Even if I'm only here, you know, for a few minutes or whatever, you meet the right people, you always pick something from them. You always take something. Um, whether whether it's, you know, through business, like I said, or maybe a future relationship, a future friendship. But there's always opportunities. And I'm always around, you know, explaining what my experiences have been. And I think everybody can, in a way, take one bit here or there that they can apply, you know, and they can always use. Um, even though even though I'm not as experienced as most here, I'm sure there's something that we can relate, we can talk about, and you know, we can take that with us. And we can use that. I may take something from you, you may take something from me, and in the future, who knows, maybe a year from now, five years from now, whenever, that little bit will help you in, in the long run. Um, I'm just very happy to always have been around, you know, so many great people. Uh, with, like I said, with Robert and now Amado and everybody, you know, James, everybody has been around me, have 
help me. And that's why I'm also very willing to come and help and share my experience, my story. Um, it just, you know, another, another point that anybody can do it, you know, but it takes some time, dedication. Um, if I go back and tell you about my dad, I mean, you know, my dad and my mom, they came out here from Mexico, you know, immigrants, you know, just like a lot of people, you know, can relate. And they were in search of the American dream. My dad, you know, working in strawberry fields with my mom and just, you know, eventually making out of that. And now my dad is retired and, you know, he's been also in the real estate buying properties and, and branding properties for many, many years now. So it's kind of like, you know, you see the opportunities there. Um, and if you stick with it long enough, you're going to see the results. Um, again, just very happy to be here and meet every one of you. and. You know, I'm still here, so if anybody else has any other questions, we can always talk about it some more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, very few times will you get an opportunity to be before a gentleman that's literally been watched millions and millions of people around the world. They know who Mikey Garcia is. Any questions? Jose Luis, any questions for Mikey? Very proud of you. Thank you, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Hey Mikey, um, what would you tell us about the importance of discipline? I mean, just overall, I mean, the, the market is kind of tough right now. So talk to us about discipline from a boxing perspective, from a business perspective. Well, look, comparing, comparing you know, business with boxing, um, I did mention about discipline and the dedication that, that, that it requires to be successful. Um, it goes hand in hand in, in business. You gotta be very de dedicated and very disciplined to stay on track, um, not to get depressed, not to get let down, you know, feel all sad about it. You gotta keep focusing on, on the end result, the end goal. Um, in boxing, I had, you know, obstacles. I had, you know, things that kept me from achieving my, my goals at that particular time, but that didn't keep me from achieving those goals in the future. You know, I actually was uh, in a legal battle with a former promoter of mine that kept me away from the boxing for two and a half years. When I was at my prime, 25 years old, two-time world champion, undefeated, about to become a big, big star, and I, through politics and business and boxing, I was held back for two and a half years from fighting. So a lot of people could have thought, oh, that's it, his career is over. Or when he comes back, it's not gonna be the same. Well, I made it a goal to stay in shape, stay dedicated to boxing, get training. When I came back, I, I ran with it, and I had probably the better part of my career when I came back, you know? So same thing in business. Yeah, it may be tougher now, it's slowed down, you know, this last year or two, and things are, are shifting, things are changing, but you guys are still here. A lot of people are not here, a lot of people have left. A lot of people have left the industry looking for other, other career opportunities. Not to say that they may not be successful, but I'm sure most of you guys that have been here for you know more than 10, 15 years will already know that it's just part of the game. Sometimes you gotta you know survive a little bit, but the, the future part is gonna be probably even better. Better opportunities you know coming very shortly. What I'm hearing is that your setback, which is a small setback, set you up for your yes, comeback. comeback. Yes. Yeah. The way I, I um, explain this is when I was on the shelf for those two and a half years that I couldn't fight, I seen a lot of other fighters, the same weight class, same age as me, really moving forward with their careers. And when I finally was able to come back, it was kind of like a slingshot effect. Because mm -hmm. I was preparing myself during that time I was educating myself on the business of boxing through litigation, through the lawsuit that we had. I actually learned a lot. So when I came back, I didn't have a promoter anymore. I, I promoted myself uh, along with other promoters I co-promoted and I managed myself. So I was able to pick the fights that I wanted, venues, dates, all that. So when I finally came back, it was like a slingshot effect. I flew past everybody that was in front of me at one time. They stayed behind. But I was, like I said, I didn't so I can really like, achieve all that. I have the better, best part of my career after that. So like I said, a little, little bit right now, the time may be a little different, a little tough sometimes, 
but it's uh, it's a moment that you can educate yourself, prepare yourself, so that when those opportunities do come knocking, you're already there, you're ready. Yes. Thank you. Who's back there? Guys, I'm going to say something to add to what he's saying. We were still buying properties, and he was basically unemployed. Those those two and a half years, we were actually starting. That's when I started. That's I had bought properties before, but. During that time, that's when I, I realized, look, I gotta do something. You know, I can't just sit, you know, and, and not do anything. So I took that time to get in, in, in involved in real estate a lot more. And the last few years, right before my, my, my actual retirement, I was getting, you know, deeper and deeper in real estate because I knew my retirement was gonna be, you know, coming very, very soon. So I wanted to prepare myself. Like I said, it's all about getting the right information, preparing yourself, getting the right, you know, tools so that you can be, you know, uh, ready for, for those opportunities. Yes. So, Mike, with all the success that you have, how do you prefer yourself to remain grounded? <laughs> well, I mean, look, no matter the amount of success that someone has, uh, I, don't, I don't believe that there's a reason for you to change. Um, if you were a good person, before you're successful, you're gonna be a greater person when you are successful. Because you can help so many more people, you can you know, give more, you can you know, donate, you can do whatever you want to help people. If you were a mean person without being successful, you're gonna be a meaner person when you are. So now you have to live that. I never changed all this time, you know, by my mom, by my dad, our family, you know, our values uh, are very instilled in, 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 in me and that's that's just who I am. I don't I don't feel like I'm better than anybody. In fact, like I said, I want to see everybody be successful. I want to see everybody, my friends, my family. I want to see everybody, you know, do do better. And that's just the way I am. And I don't feel like there's a need to change. I mean, if you're gonna change, then you know, for your own personal, you know, gain or your own personal satisfaction, then you're not that good of a person. Amen. Shame on you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what? Honestly, what you just shared right now in regards to being a good person where you are, you know, regardless of what you have or what you don't sure. have, it's, to me, it's poor. You know, that's who I am. That's how I carry myself in this industry. And thank you for sharing your, of course. your testimony. Thank you. Of course. Well, anybody? Hey, Mikey. Um, so what are you doing now, now that you're retired? More real estate. <laughs> more real estate, yeah. For sure, uh, and, and we've been talking to a lot of people. I've met a lot of people in, over the years, um, and we, we know, like I said, it's, it's a little different situation right now, different different time than it was, you know, two three years ago. Um, but the opportunities are still there if you look closely and if you find the right opportunity, go ahead and take advantage of that. You know, let let, let that be an opportunity. Um, but I also feel that in the next few months, maybe twelve months, eighteen months, you know, we don't know exact dates, but Things are gonna start changing to allow you know more business to, to more opportunities exactly. Yeah. And right now I'm trying to prepare myself so that when those opportunities come, I'll be ready. ready. Yep. Yay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's give a big, big round of applause. You know, a lot of times when you see somebody like Michael super successful. And I hear people say, well, you know, they're not taking it with them. I'm not taking nothing. But listen, in life, it's not about taking stuff. It's where you're at, you want to leave this a better place. And I challenge each one of you to really take what he said at heart and run with it. We have a gift a card from John with the um, insurance company, ASI, right? And so we are going to pull a card. We have Barbara here. Hey, Barbara. Hey, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is Jasmine. Yes. Jasmine. And our sponsors, they donate money. They said, can we give money? So, is it okay to give you, or you, you guys want me to go get a Starbucks instead of this? Cash will work, right? Cash will work. Let's be yes, it's work. That's for sure. <laughs> that is? 
that? Who's that? Let's see. Oh. We don't have a name there, remember? Southern Home Inspection. Southern Home Inspection. Southern Home Coming out. And that is, oh, Javier de Vega T. Okay. Okay. Hey, you know what? The one comment that I have after listening to Mikey Garcia is, isn't this a beautiful country, the land of opportunities? I'm one that I am grateful every day. I think about how grateful I am that my kids were born here, the opportunities that they have running business and my grandchildren being born here so this is a great country you know so that's my one comment thank you